Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Brethren in Christ, Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. This is Timothy Flanders at the meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King who has conquered death. And bestowed upon us the Paschal Mystery, which is the controversial topic for today's show. Welcome to all of our viewers, listeners around the world, especially our Aussies. Right now it's Monday evening in Aussie land and Kiwi land. We are joined once again by our co-hosts, Fowler and Cavazos. Bannister is here in spirit somewhere. Uh, Fowler, how, how was the Fowler family Easter? Oh, it was pretty good. Uh, we were fortunate this year to not have sick children. In years past, we've had to split time in the Triduum. Uh, so, but this year, no such thing. We we were all very pretty healthy and able to go to Holy Thursday Mass, Good Friday Liturgy, uh, Easter Vigil, uh, which was not exactly a vigil, but close. We started at two p.m. Um, and only four hours later we had finished up so it was good and the kids were actually remarkably well behaved for four hour mass then sunday morning yeah it was it was great um sunday morning actually it's one of my favorites i mean obviously but uh, particularly because our men's scola chants uh the, the, one of the templar chants Kruchem sanctam subi oh, on the way yeah, in yeah. it's a cappella and they're you know that you hear the little bell and then it's quiet you're like okay wait i thought we were starting and then they begin it's almost like they want that pause to get your attention and then here we go so i don't know probably eight guys in the back of church as they process up just chanting and it's a pretty hardcore chant so that's fantastic. sunday was amazing um had some uh, family and some good friends over it was a good time how about you guys that's awesome well, Cavazos got to do a monastic retreat. Uh, Nicholas Cavazos, OP. OP. That's new. You'll have to explain o- that. OP for either order of preachers or if you're young, right? Overrated pa- player. <laughs> Something oh, like is that, that a Zoomer? <laughs> That's a Zoomer uh, pejorative? Is that what that is? Well, uh, oh, yeah, pejorative. Well, OP, I guess for a Gen Zer, would just be like, OP as in overpowered. So like in the world of video games, you're OP, overpowered, something like that. Mm. But uh, but not in this case. That's not what I'm using it for. But I'll try not to overpower you guys today in our in our debate. Best okay. that You've been overpowered by the Holy Ghost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> then the Spirit um, my, rushed upon him. Yeah, my Easter and Holy Week was phenomenal. So I had no kids, so no chances for sickness. And that mm. means I have time. No chances for meritorious masses. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. sure. If that makes you feel better, sure. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, mine was phenomenal. I went to, so I've done this a couple years now. I went over to the Institute of Christ the King over in Louisiana. That's the closest that we got here. And uh, it's really, really cool. It's an, so just like the Institute, they find all these old historic buildings and they basically refurbish an old dying parish. And so this parish was built 1820s, I believe it was. And uh, it was used for a long time. And then I don't know when it was basically abandoned. I'm going to guess like 30s, 40s, because it was eventually taken and made into the city's courthouse ended up becoming kind of like the city seal and things like this. And this is for a fairly small town. Um, But then eventually the bishop who is extremely friendly to the Institute, 
a personal friend of Cardinal Burke. He was looking for a place for them to come into his diocese, I think back in 2013, 14, something like that. So very, fairly recent. And the city decided, yeah, we just don't want this old building. We're just going to basically knock it down. And so they called beforehand, thank the Lord, the diocese. And they're like, hey, we got this old historic Catholic church. Like, we're just going to get rid of it, built into something else. Do you want it? And he was like, actually, yes, there's, I know a perfect group <laughs> to come in for it. And so we went over there, celebrated Holy Week and pre-55 Holy Week. It's just, it's so rich. It's so incredibly rich in all of the prayers and um, and all of the gestures that it does. And so, yeah, I'm with you. Four hour long liturgy. Ours started at um, six o'clock. So we were out by, you know, 10, 30 ish or something like that. And then managed to be insane. I, I On Easter, I uh, our mass in Texas here is in the afternoon. And so I just drove back home like a crazy person on Easter Wow. Served a, a beautiful, essentially quasi solemn high mass for Easter, and uh, yeah, it was great. So, couldn't ask for more. Thanks be to God. Well, today's topic we're going to talk about the Paschal mystery, and I'm going to present once again what I would term the Eastern Catholic critique of the SSPX. Before we get into that topic, just want to remind everyone to join the guild. We need your support to run this apostolate. I just created the master list of all the guild videos. So there's 136 videos currently for guild members only, which deals with all the more controversial topics. And so you can get that. Go to meaningofcatholic.com slash register. And so we require, we ask our patrons, our guild members to contribute financially, but also to invoke our patrons every single day, which are our lay patrons. And one of those patrons is St. Joseph, Terror of Demons. And that's under whose patronage we are conducting the St. Joseph Dialogos. This Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 Central, we'll have Fowler and myself talking with the great Dr. Lawrence Feingold, which is where I will present uh, a trad critique of Vatican II, Day Verbum 11, which I contain in my book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we'll have Dr. Feingold uh, take that apart and uh, respond with his thoughts on that. So that'll, that'll be a very good show. I'm looking forward to that. So it'll be Wednesday night at 8 p.m. And then we're the today's show. We're going to be talking about this Paschal mystery, and we'll, we will continue with this conversation in the Dialogos of May, which is where we'll talk about the theology of the Ascension for Ascension, and that'll be all related to all these things. So related to all that, I wanted to go to this beautiful artwork from Liturgy of the Home uh, first to introduce this topic. Uh, if you want this, this calendar is fantastic. It's a great catechetical tool for the kids uh, and as well for us. So this is the uh, liturgy of the home.com. You can get the calendar. But what this depicts so beautifully is the Paschal mystery, which we're going to talk about. And to, to just tell you first what i'm getting at is the term paschal mystery as i will show may it comes up in the liturgy of the church but it refers to the uh, typological fulfillment of the passover in egypt which is the epistle both on good friday as well as one of the prophecies for the easter vigil is the institution of the paschal mystery and in this paschal mystery jesus destroys death and by doing so, he goes down to Hades, which is depicted here, where Jesus is going down to Hades to get Adam and Eve. And I love what Michaela Harrison did. She put St. Joseph in there. So St. Joseph is down in Hades. Jesus is going down to Hades. Meanwhile, Our Lady is Our Lady. The reason Our Lady is commemorated on Saturday is because she stayed perfectly in hope of the resurrection. But it's during the uh, death of Christ, he goes down to Hades. And this is in the Eastern liturgy, in the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, with the phrase, uh, in the grave with the body, but in Hades with the soul, in paradise with the thief, and on the throne with the Father and the Spirit, which thou, O Christ, filling all things, thyself uncircumscribed. This is a prayer in that liturgy of the East. So Jesus goes to Hades. He 
he takes forth Adam and Eve, which is then depicted at the resurrection right here, uh, with it, which is Jesus bringing forth Adam and Eve out of the tomb. Also, St. Joseph is looking to him and Our Lady. I, I love this this detail here with that Michaela Harrison was just the uh, Our Lady and Jesus conquering, uh, locking eyes as, as the resurrection is happening. So there is the destruction of death, which is this Paschal mystery, which is where Jesus has, passes over death itself and brings forth the sleeping saints to light. So this is the essence of the Paschal mystery. And what I want to begin this conversation with is to enunciate the fundamental principle from Carol Wojtyla. In his book, Sources of Renewal, page 39, he says this. We must always bear in mind the principle of integration. And he talks about when we talk about Vatican II, Vatican II must organically be inserted into the whole deposit of faith so as to be integrated with the teaching of all preceding councils and pontiffs. There has been undue emphasis laid on divisions and differences between the so-called integralists and progressives, while too little was said about the fact that both groups and their responsibility towards the church must be unswervingly guided by the principle and demands of its identity and that they must both therefore respect the principle of integration which is a precondition of the church's identity. So I take Wojtyla to mean that when we introduce something or reintroduce something like the Paschal Mystery, it must be integrated into the entire body of the church. So there, 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 not, there should not be this emphasis on the divisive features, but the integration of the whole into this symphony of harmony that all of these things harmonize. Because in the history of the atonement, what seems to be the case is that the early church, the patristic understanding of the atonement is this paschal mystery, which emphasizes uh, a certain aspects of that mystery, namely the destruction of death, the conquering over the devil, who is the typological fulfillment of Pharaoh. The Red Sea is typologically fulfilled in death itself. So Jesus passes through the Red Sea, uh, meaning that he passes through death and destroys death. And this makes sense historically because in the early church um, crucifixion is this shameful humiliation of death and what is sort of the the crucifixion and the passion of christ are understood in the light of the resurrection so there's this great emphasis on the resurrection and the conquering of death by the early church and in the preaching of the apostles which we see in the new testament especially in the book of acts so this is sort of this patristic early church understanding now as time goes on, especially in the West, now, and, and I should emphasize too, in the early church's depiction of the atonement and the passion and the true woman and the resurrection, there is an emphasis on the resurrection and the cross is used as a symbol of victory, meaning a, a symbol of destroying death. There is not so much a depiction of the crucifixion and, and showing Jesus on the cross in, in religious art, sacred art, early sacred heart. And that's because there's this emphasis on one aspect or a few aspects of this destruction of death. Now, it's later on when you start to see the crucifixion more meditated on in the Western Christendom. And that is a result of the a true development of doctrine where the church begins to meditate. Now, centuries and centuries removed from the humiliation of the Roman Empire of the crucifixion the church begins to meditate on the passion more and more and more. And this is, I think, it's pulling back the mystery so that the church can sort of without fear enter into the sufferings of Christ and this, this spiritual, the spirituality of the passion. And this is where in sacred art begins to depict more and more the crucifixion. And now we have the crucifix, Jesus on the cross as the most ubiquitous symbol of the atonement in the West. And what begins to come out of this is, is an emphasis on another aspect, which somewhat lay hidden, I think, in the patristic period. But it is the satisfaction of the wrath of God, in a sense, that Jesus himself takes. He takes the curse of the rebellious son who is uh, in the book of Deuteronomy. He takes this curse and he hangs upon a tree for it. 
and there's this satisfaction of the wrath of God, which comes out into the West as they meditate on the, on the, on the sufferings of Christ. But in the sort of a, a similar sense, this begins to be emphasized almost above all in the mystery of the atonement, all the different aspects of the mystery of the atonement. So that in the 19th and 20th century, when all these, these people begin to re, be reading the Greek fathers, they sort of rediscover this Paschal mystery, this bigger aspect of the destruction of death and all of these things. And this is the resource of all of the, this Eastern more emphasized more in the Eastern liturgies, but also in the West. So this is this resource of all that comes out of Vatican II and in the new liturgy. But because there's a lack of this principle of integration, there begins to be this, this sort of tension between these two different models and two different mysteries of the atonement. Um, and so the SSPX comes along and says, this Paschal mystery is a foreign concept. Now, this is coming from uh, their text, the problem of the liturgical reform which is where they criticize this concept of the Paschal mystery. And I think can I, can I stop you for just oh, a moment? Is that an Angelus press? Like, is that an official SSPX publication yeah. or is that one of their it priests is. or something? It yes. is. Okay. All right. So this That's is, all. this is the, it's called the problem of liturgical reform published by Angelus press. And the author is the society of St. Pius X. Okay. So this Fair is enough. more or less an official, um, something, I don't know. How, it's how a, it's an official letter, uh, like study that was written from the SSPX priest address to then Pope John Paul II. In right, gotcha. so, so this is it's and it says on page uh, 39 is that the expression Paschal mystery appears only a few times in the writing of the church father fathers until the 20th century. The expression has no special meaning in the right of theologians. And what, what their point is, is that what happens is all of these progressives take this concept of Paschal mystery and they use it, to try to negate and dismiss the whole tradition of the, the spirituality of Christ's suffering that has been developed over these centuries. And so the SSPX, first of all, is making a very important point. They're saying this is wrong. And it is It's absolutely totally correct of the SSPX to say something like that. It's a very important point for them to make. And um, in this address of Ratzinger, which came shortly after this letter of SSPX in the early 2000s, Ratzinger also concedes this, and he says, yes, there are authors, and the SSPX cites many authors who are using this sort of Paschal mystery, in order, and that we've already seen this, like Walter Casper or other, the other people are trying to use a false resource among them. They're trying to cherry pick something from the early church in order to overthrow things that were passed down to us by our fathers in order to promote modernism. This is the tactic for the modernists. That's what they do. They have this false resource among them. So first of all, we need to concede to the SSPX. Yes, this is a very important point. You're, you're making an important point. This Paschal mystery is being destroyed. You know, the, you, we, can't, we can't have the stations of the cross without adding the 15th station, the, the resurrection. Uh, that, you know, this is, this is an example of that. You know, we, we can't receive communion kneeling because we have to receive standing because that's what the East does because they believe in the resurrection and the Paschal mystery and all this stuff. But all of these things are misconstrued and misguided and, and misapplied because we don't need to we need, we don't need to destroy these things. We can just restore something that's already there. And I can quote text here that I'll, I'll quote in a minute from the Roman Rite, which talk about this same thing. But at the same time, I find that the SSPX conclusion that we need to therefore resist a true resource among, on the other hand, to be to to all also be misguided because then it's it's not this principle of integration which where we, we can integrate this paschal mystery theology and and reconcile it and synthesize it with this further elaboration of the sufferings of christ which happens in the west um because the whole paschal mystery and this is what ratzker points out he says the whole paschal mystery is the sacrifice of the lamb of god so there is a sacrifice and suffering content in the Paschal mystery, which should not be negated. But there is the triumph also that should not be negated either. So this is where the Eastern Catholic perspective of Vatican II comes in. And this is where, where I'm coming from, coming from the Eastern Orthodox, coming into Vatican II. There's, there's a, uh, there is a 
gratitude for Vatican II's resource and all of the Paschal mystery from the Eastern Catholic perspective, because in their celebration of the resurrection and the atonement and the Triduum, there is this great emphasis on this thing, the Paschal mystery, the destruction of death, as I said, as a, the opening prayer of this whole show was this, the Paschal hymn and the Paschal hymn is, is, is shouted and sung over and over and over and over and over throughout Paschal time. So you, at, throughout Paschal Tide up to the Ascension, you're, you're singing that in multiple languages, joyfully and triumphantly. And so there's the destruction of death. <clears throat> and here, let me quote here from um, the pre-55 Blessing of the Palms. Uh, this is uh, in my Father Lassant's Missal 394. Uh, and this is the Blessing of the Palms in the pre-55 rite. It says this, the palm branches, therefore, look to his triumph over the Prince of Death. But the sprigs of olive proclaim that in certain manner the spiritual unction has already come. For that favored throng even then understood that our Redeemer, condoling with the sorrows of mankind, was to battle with the prince of death for the life of the whole world and was to triumph die by dying. That we may, and then it petitions God that we may be worthy to gain the victory over the empire of death and to partake of his glorious resurrection. Because the palm branches were a ritual then already used by Roman emperors to proclaim the victory of the emperor over this other barbarian tribe that they had just, so the, 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 the Roman emperor would come in and they already have palm branches, which is the symbol of the victory over this enemy. And this is also in the uh, Easter sequence that's prayed every single day through, throughout Easter week, uh, Victime Pascali. And uh, we also see in various collects of the Easter vigil, this celebration of the Easter sacrament, and this is important to understand that the, the Latin term sacrament is translating the Greek term mystery. In Greek, mystery is the word for sacrament. In Latin, sacramentum means mystery. So when, when the Easter Vigil talks about the, the Paschal sacrament, that's the same thing as the Paschal mystery. The Paschal mystery, the whole Paschal typological fulfillment of the Triduum. So this is essentially, and there's more I can bring up, but I want to stop here and get y'all's thoughts. But Essentially, there is this if we if we take this principle of integration, I think the SSPX, we, we should concede to the SSPX that, yes, we have a problem with this, the misuse of the Paschal Mystery. But at the same time, we need to have an integration of the Paschal Mystery to resource some of these things that have been um, not not lost, per se, in the West, but uh, things that have just been forgotten with our, with the glorious uh, meditation on the Passion of Christ. Um, so there needs to be this principle of integration. So that, in essence, is the Eastern Catholic critique of the SSPX. Um, Cavazos or Fowler, what are your thoughts on this so far? Go ahead, Fowler. Yeah, go for Me? it. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, right off the bat, I well, I don't disagree with His Holiness John Paul II. Um, I think that that principle that you described from his book, what would you call it? Sources of Renewal? I yeah, Sources of Renewal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that principle is n not just for uh, doing resourcement theology, but would apply to all of Catholic life, meaning if it can be integrated, then go ahead. But watch out for the dangers on either side. So with that in mind, um, looking at this in particular, it's almost as if... Um, I, I would, I would, I'm not correcting you, Tim, but I would rephrase what you've said a minute ago about something that had been forgotten. I wouldn't say it had been forgotten. I would just say it was emphasized differently because it, it would be impossible for the church to have forgotten about the importance of the resurrection. But maybe it wasn't liturgically expressed as clearly as it could have been or, or celebrated in a way that was as fitting and, and uh, jubilant a, as possible. So, that seems to me to be the path forward um, to not mm, to not look at this and say, hey, wait a minute, we haven't done this in a long time. That means we shouldn't. But in, instead to say, oh, that's right. Remember when we used to do this a lot? Yeah, let's do that again. That, that's kind of where I'm, I'm coming from with it. Um, I had another thought, but it just escaped me. So Nick, well, why, that's why good. don't you I go? I like that and... emphasized differently. <clears throat> Uh, because yeah, because I just it, yeah. it doesn't sit well to say that um, this is something that the church has forgotten about, almost as if to say, well, we considered it, we tried it out, it wasn't that great, and now we're just going to put it away. I don't think that's the case. Um, oh, I remember. 
the it, I know this isn't technically true and and you could probably find proof text upon proof text to refute me but it seems uh just on a cursory glance of the tradition that the way the roman uh the way western theology developed as you mentioned before with an increasing emphasis on the crucifixion and not a de-emphasis on the rest of the paschal mystery but just you know kind of left it there it seems like what happened was that the resurrection became more of uh, a sign or a symbol and not a part of the theology of the atonement. Now, again, I know that you could probably find, you know, mountains of patristic scholarship and medievals to, to refute that, but just a, gl a glance on the surface, we emphasize the cross, we emphasize the passion, we emphasize the sacrifice, we receive communion, then we go home. You know, there, there isn't that moment in the mass where we're explicitly proclaiming the glory of the resurrection. You know? So that's, it seems again, that this resurgence, if you will, of, of the, the totality, the integral nature of the Paschal mystery, as it's been presented in the last 60, 70 years or so, um, is a good thing. And, and we should welcome it. Uh, as long as we don't fall off the rails on the other side. So there we go. What do you think, Nick? Yeah, so <clears throat> a couple things. So first to start off with Tim's point when it comes to um, integration, I, I would agree with the principle in and of itself. I think it's good. I'm not necessarily a fan of the way that His Holiness John Paul II phrased it when he kind of pits integralists versus progressives. Just because at least whenever I hear that, now again, this is just me responding to that initial small quote itself. So without any other background of what the rest of the book is saying, it just, <laughs> the way I'm looking at it, I'm like, well, integralism is like deeply rooted in just the social teaching of the church. And so, you know, it's like, that's not something that is, um, you know, just like a, a minority opinion by just some right wing people over here. I'm like, well, mm, I don't know. Like, that seems like the just the political thought of the church. And so to pit that against progressives, I think, is just falling into what I call like the error of the supposed moderate. Everyone wants to be a moderate. And that seems to be kind of the mentality even today of what's like, I don't, don't want to be on the right, don't want to be on the left. But we do this in the church. It's just like, yeah, I don't want to be a rad trap, but I don't want to be progressive. Let me just fall in the middle. I'm like, well. All right. If that makes you sleep better at night, I guess. But, you know, I think we have to deal with the issues more. So when we take this, I guess, principle of integration, I think what we have to realize is where I think you're right, Tim. And this is one area that I think the SSPX could do better is, is when you read that beginning of that chapter that you quoted from <clears throat> in the problem with liturgical form. A good thing I will concede is I don't think that they do a very good job in really just showing the history of the Paschal mystery. Uh, like the usage of that term. But they kind of admit that in the beginning of the book when they say that, you know, essentially this is not going to be uh, a mountainous volume, right, of scholarly work. But I think it's right because the way they phrase it, I don't think is the best where they say, you know, this is this this term is used a few times, things like that. Well, I'm like, mm, no, like it's used quite a bit. You know, it's not something that's just used on a cursory level here and there. But <clears throat> this is where I think that they're right that you talked about, but I think is the larger issue. Really, when we look at the, the whole of the book, the book is broken down into three portions. And the central pro portion of the book, which is what you quoted from, is essentially giving theological meat to the first part and then the third part of the book. The first part of the book being <clears throat> really showing essentially how the new missile is a liturgical rupture in its rubrics. And I, I key phrase rubrics, and then how the third portion, it, it's expounding on that concept more. And what the SSPX assertion is this, is that that phrase, the Paschal mystery, has been used by modernists in an antiquarian fashion, where essentially, when we go back and we look at many of the men that were involved in the creation of the new mass, so on the concilium team, and they quote many texts inside of the chapter two, this or second section, that these people are essentially taking this phrase, Paschal Mystery, and what they're doing <clears throat> is they're using this phrase 
as the bulwark or as the chapter heading, if you will, of a new conception of the redemption. And this is something that was already being condemned by Pius XII and Humani Generis in paragraph 16, 17, 18, and 26, when he is asserting that these um, new theologians are coming along, stripping scholastic terminology, which can be polished, he, he, he admits, right. but can be uh, gutted, and they are imposing um, dogmatic relativism. So what essentially takes place is that the Paschal Mystery Theology, as it ends up being uh, expounded, is that God in traditional theology, right, is a being whom we owe justice to. And we are creatures who are made in the order of creation, and we owe God justice. Well, when we sin, we commit uh, an injustice against God, or you could maybe rephrase it as it disorders the order of justice. And what takes place is that God is bound to punish mankind. God does not delight in mankind's punishment, but he does delight in the restoring of the order of justice that the punishment inflicts upon man. And so when the Son of God died for mankind, Christ died principally as an action of justice towards his Father because this, the atonement satisfies the wrath of God. Not that Christ bore the wrath of God in a Calvinistic sense of want to be careful there, but that Christ's death satisfied the wrath of God. And um, this act of justice that our Lord did for us upon the cross was motivated by charity first towards his father and then by charity towards us. But where the Paschal mystery starts to this new mentality of the Paschal mystery, what they do is they say, well, how can a loving God abuse his son for mankind. And so they start kind of going down this, this rabbit hole of God the Father, as portrayed in traditional theology, is this sadist being who basically wants to pour out wrath upon all of those whom he does dis he dislikes. You know, he's very, I guess, neurotic in that type of way. And what takes place is they say, well, this mentality uh, does not correspond with our understanding of modern man and definitely not his needs. And so what ends up taking place is a reorientation of the sacrifice to where Christ dies, not as an action of justice to his father, but just as a show of his love for you. Right? And you even hear this in kind of modern Catholic parlance to a degree where you hear, well, why did Christ die for us? To show us his love. Well, there's truth in that, absolutely. But if it's rooted in getting rid of the action of justice, which is a huge portion that's a problem. Last thing I'll say to, to tie this all in, and then I, I welcome both of your gentlemen's critiques, <clears throat> is that when we understand that they were fooling around with this conception, right, fooling around with this conception, this mentality, I believe, fundamentally gets into the new missile, because specifically when you see a reduction in sacrificial language around the concept of sacrifice of propitiation, not sacrifice of praise, not sacrifice of adoration, not sacrifice of thanksgiving, but sacrifice of propitiation. You see that a lot of the reasons why they were doing this, and this is actually what Humani Generis speaks of. Pope Pius XII says, why are they doing these things? He says, to be ecumenical with Protestants, right? They go back to the fathers, they go back to the scriptures, and why are they doing this? They want to be, you know, buddy-buddy with the Protestants. Is that the new missile fundamentally, because you see essentially no mention of sacrifice of propitiation in, in the in the rubrics or in the texts or in the prayers, this mentality seeps in there and has had devastating effects. And so I think that where we can give a, a, a concession, I would say, absolutely, you're absolutely correct. And I would also agree <clears throat> that we maybe in practical devotion need to be better at remembering the resurrection because um, it is as St. Paul says, right, without the resurrection, then all hope is lost, right? <laughs> there, there is no point. If Christ did not rise from the dead, then it would have just been uh, a public execution, and that's all that it would have been in, on a historical level, right? He would not be the Son of God. So we do need to emphasize that more. I would say, well, that's just called Easter octave, Paschal Tide, look at all these prayers, look at all these devotions that are attached, right? The Regina Chaley instead of the Angelus, we're all standing instead of kneeling, all of these types of beautiful conceptions. But when we actually look at what they mean by Paschal Mystery, it's 
it's very, very, it's sus, man. It's sus, and uh, that's just what happens. So <laughs> it's sus. No cap. No cap. Sus, sus meaning uh, suspect. Yeah. Suspicious. It's suspect. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. That's I, that's Zoomer for. I, I, think uh, that I don't that, like the way this sounds. I think that the <laughs> you 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 bring it to the the most salient point, which is the new mass itself, which does reduce propitiation. I think of the Placia Tibi Sancta Trinitas prayer at the end of the Latin Mass, which says, uh, "It's it, it petitions Almighty God that this Mass may be a propitiation mm-hmm. for those for whom it has been offered," which is a which is one of the many prayers which was uh, taken out of the new mass. The new mass yeah, only I contains think 13. There's a reference in the offertory too. Yeah. The offertory too. Yeah. yeah. Probably in the canon. Offertory. And then when you look at, for instance, even the creation of Eucharistic canon too, without getting into all the aspects of like, it's written on a napkin in a restaurant and all of that kind of cringe nonsense, you do see, um, even more of the history of why that was created, you know, a lot of it was essentially, oh, is this a prayer of, I think it was St. Ambrose. I might be wrong. So take that with a grain of salt, but it was supposedly Mm -hmm. a prayer used by one of the early church fathers and let's use this and it's short and it doesn't talk about propitiation and let's use this and an effort to um, basically be buddy, buddy with Protestants, specifically Lutheranism. Sometimes whenever we say like Protestants, they're not talking about like Billy Baptist playing his guitar down the street. Like he's not, they're not talking about that. They're talking about Luther's theology where he hates propitiatory nature, the propitiatory yeah. nature of the sacrifice. And so when we look at Eucharistic prayer two, Eucharistic prayer three, Eucharistic prayer four, there's next to no mention of propitiatory sacrifice. And what becomes a result is that on pot, I'll say this and I promise I'll be quiet because I don't want to hog all the time, but <laughs> Whenever I, as an example, right, give, uh, I'm, I'm a catechist teacher, right? And so I, I, I train both adults and I train uh, sixth graders. I love teaching kids. Like, it's just, it's so much fun. But I found that both adults and kids, first and foremost, who have been going to catechism maybe their whole life or been brought up in the church, they have no concept that the mass is a sacrifice or if they even know that it's a sacrifice. And the reason I find this out is, not just through talking, but giving them tests and them not knowing that it's a sacrifice. Um, whenever I ask them, like, okay, you know, it's a sacrifice, and they're like, okay, yeah, that sounds it sounds very Catholicy, right? Sacrifice. But then when you ask them, well, what does that mean? They have no concept that their sin demands some type of ordering of justice. And mm-hmm. when we look at the reasons why. A lot of them who go to mass every week, some of these kids, right? And some of these adults who go to mass every day, right? They think the purpose of mass is merely to receive our Lord. And that is beautiful, right? But that's not the main purpose. Like the, you receiving our Lord is just your participation in one degree, right? One degree of participation in the Eucharistic sacrifice, like it would be in the Old Testament where the priests are having to consume the sacrifice that has been given for the atonement of sins. And so... That's just the problem is it's like in modern parlance, because the new liturgy has reduced these things down so much, most Catholics think you're just going basically to commemorate the Last Supper, which is the goal of Paschal Mystery Theology as expounded by the Reformers. And so those are my thoughts. Yeah, I I wanted to bring up the quote from Humani Generis because this this quote is so good, where this is from Humani Generis, where he says, this is Pius XII. 1950. We may clothe our philosophy in more convenient and richer dress, make it more vigorous and more effective terminology, divested of certain scholastic aids, found less useful, prudently enrich it with the fruits of progress of the human mind. But never may we overthrow it or contaminate it with false principles or regard it as a great but obsolete relic. And this is what so many of the proponents of the Paschal Mystery did, was that they Mm -hmm. wanted to overthrow something instead of just integrate something into it. I think that there's... um, I was just talking with a friend about a book uh, which argues how this propitiatory nature of the sacrifice of Christ was not as much in the patristics. And they sort of viewed this as a departure when this occurs to be emphasized more and more, as, as you say at Trent and and that, that need not be seen as a departure, but it it can just be seen as a, a development and deepening of this great mystery that the church meditates on the sacrifice of her spouse, the bridegroom, 
And so then when the church reintegrates more of the Paschal mystery, that that need not be a departure either, but mm -hmm. a, a, just a, a reintegration of, of that same beautiful thing. But there is this, this emphasis, this desire to overthrow something as, as if it were a, an obsolete relic. Mm -hmm. And that is why it is so critical that we have to keep this principle of integration with keeping the old mass, obviously, keeping that in existence and giving that the place of honor. While I, I think that in principle, I, I'm, mm -hmm. not, I'm not opposed, no one should be opposed to the integration of some old texts in addition to, I, I think what, what, what should have been the case, in my opinion, I mean, I, um, whatever that's worth, I mean, if there's it's worth something, Tim. We love your so, opinion. Yeah, some. I, I mean, if some. there's if there's a you know if there's a discovery of old <laughs> texts and we find Eucharistic prayer two or we find these uh, ancient canons or whatever, then just introduce something new and keep the old as well. <laughs> like uh, there need not be like we have to destroy what is old and add something new. You can just add something new and say here's something right. new as well. Mm -hmm. Anyways, follow your thoughts. Yeah, no, it's sort of like the. Um, well, we, so in the Easter season, we chant the Vidi Aquam instead of the Asparagus mm -hmm. May. And if I'm not mistaken, as that stream flows from the right side of the temple, it's deeper and deeper and deeper and broader and broader and broader until Ezekiel can no longer walk in it. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be so that's surely some sort of reference or maybe a, a type foreshadowing of the tradition that, okay, what started as the stream, a little blood and water from the side of Christ, right here in Jerusalem. Now over time, it's a little broader, a little deeper and pretty soon. Uh, well, maybe not pretty soon. Eventually at the end of the world, it will be truly Catholic encompassing the totality Right. So that's, I, you know, and naturally I agree with what you guys are saying about um, the integral aspect of development. I will, you know, I, I don't disagree, Nicholas, with the fact that this has been utterly abused and, and twisted, especially in, in the English speaking world, because I have uh, students who, who say the same thing. Well, but do we really need to go to confession because doesn't God love us? Mm -hmm. like that's why you need to go to confession because that's where he'll do the thing where he loves you mm -hmm. right um and, but i don't want to i don't want anybody to take away from this conversation okay well uh concilium sort of people abused it therefore we should avoid it no we should be upset and we should try to take it back uh we should we should try to be more like uh john paul and benedict ratzinger who said no no wait a minute you can't you can't twist this concept and and morph it into your own thing this already has a meaning this already has a tradition you're not free to depart from that um bring that back you know within bounds so to speak uh and and stop twisting this onto your own destruction and and, and that of others so i think the response isn't yeah the sspx was right look at how bad this became we say, ooh, shoot, yeah, that, that was bad. Okay, we need to correct that, but not jettison the, the legitimate um, emphasis or if you want to call it the reintegration of the concept of the Paschal Mystery. So that's kind of, those, those are my, my initial reactions. Yeah, sure. Uh, side note, I think the Vidi Aquam is like one of the absolute best chants that the church has. I don't know. For me, it's just, it's always sad mm -hmm. that we only get to have it for, you know, five, six weeks, so... I just love it. I know, but man. I, yeah, no, I, I wouldn't disagree. I think that one of the interesting things is, is that if we could go back and basically play around and say, you know, what ifs, one of the great what ifs of history, it would have been very interesting to have seen in if the people such as Archbishop Lefebvre or even other just traditionally minded theologians of the time, which there were hundreds that don't get mentioned today um, in, in modern discussions and people like John Paul II and Cardinal Ratzinger, if they would have had the technological advancements that we do today where they could hop on a Zoom call, right, hop online and discuss <laughs> these things, how much easier it would have been because we know that, you know, so much of the animosity, particularly towards the archbishop, was founded on false, warm-tongue-like statements 
from people in power who did not like him, right? Who would just kind of go around. And so it kind of shut down any type of further theological discussions from taking place. Um, yeah, I would agree. I would say uh, we need to find a way into which we can reintegrate and find a, a balance between the two. Um, I think that where we practically need to go is to ask some hard questions, um, because I think we can always, again, um, you know, think about these things in the abstract and say, you know, can we take these things back through this and that action? And I think that there's legitimate questions that we can uh, ask with that. But then we also have to recognize, at least how I see it, and this is for me speaking, at least how I see it, it's like the new missile is given by the concilium who has these beliefs. So it's just like, okay, what could we take back? You know, ultimately, this would have to be something that the popes would have to come and really take back in their own authority. And then second and last thing I'd say is that with that taking back of authority, one of the things that we have to realize is that at least is in real time, that's just probably not going to happen at least for a while. Because when we have figures like Cardinal Roach saying it's not the traditional uh, you know, mass, which is the problem, but it's the traditional theology in which it imbibes is the problem, right? Okay, so this is a gentleman who is head of a Roman congregation, right, presumably over all liturgical matters, essentially saying that the Roman Missal that has been handed down immemorial is no longer theologically helpful for today. If that's not, right, <laughs> hermeneutic of rupture, then I do not know what is, you know? And so therefore, it's just like, you know, us three laymen, right, we can we can discuss these things all day long, but the only way that we're really going to see this change is if we have a serious conversation in the higher-ups and say, okay, let's look back and say, yeah, these guys who clearly did not have the best intentions at all, they were basically wanting to pander, uh, they were kind of sticking their hand in the cookie jar, right? They, they took their hand, put it in the mayonnaise, and put it in the cookie jar, and they're messing around with stuff, and they're like, let's just see what comes out. Right. Well, it wasn't Cookie Monster that came out. Right. It was something way worse. And so we'll just have to figure out. Right. And let's just see what happens. That's just going to how it's going to be. Well, yeah. Cavazos, let, let's talk about um, what what do we do as laymen? Um, and you mentioned you are a catechist. You don't have children, but you catechize children. Father mm -hmm. and I both are father catechists of our own children. And uh, we can't really do much to change the hierarchy. We can talk to them. We can pray for them. We can all do penance for them. And we do, and we will. Um, that's what we do with our fellow St. Anthony is offering up penance for the clergy as mm -hmm. we feel is our duty as lay people. But how do we integrate this to our catechism of our children? And uh, my thought is to uh, like, we all attend the Latin mass here, but I do, I'm not, I bring my son to a reverent novus ordo as well as needed as, uh, because we don't have a daily Latin mass in our area. But, um, I see that catechizing the Paschal mystery, uh, my, I, I sort of emphasize whatever is most, um, what my son gets most excited about in the Paschal mystery. And uh, it just so happens that his, his favorite thing about the Paschal mystery is the 10 plagues of Egypt. So he <laughs> loves, he loves the 10 plagues of Egypt. So we, we've so, got so it, uh... on some Prince of Egypt soundtrack. In the background. <laughs> That's all you need. <laughs> yeah. So uh, actually I showed him the Prince of Egypt for the first time this year. He loved it. Um, <clears throat> but we have that. There's this great catechism. There's this fantastic catechism for kids. It's called, the catechism of the seven sacraments and it's a lego catechism mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it's all these lego setups that somebody made and they took all these pictures and it's a catechism story and it's just superb and it's based on the actually the the teaching of pope benedict about covenant theology and the typology and it goes into all these typological references that i never many of them i had never even heard of and when it talks about the Blessed Sacrament, it goes through the story of the Ten Plagues and Egypt and everything and the Passover. And that's how Ratzinger explains what the Blessed Sacrament is. Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 I think um, it's on the one hand, there's a integrated vision that I give to my sons that I uh, catechize them. Here's the whole story. And but then I emphasize the thing that is most connected to them and i think mm -hmm. this reflects the fact that each individual catholic 
ultimately sort of finds his own spirituality within the great stream of the Vidyakwam of the tradition. Mm -hmm. Each one of us has a connection with this particular thing. Like some people have transferred over to the Eastern right because they have found such spiritual sustenance there in the Eastern spirituality. Okay. That's great. That's fine with me. I mean, mm -hmm. something that they've just connected with better. Um, for me, it's the passionist spirituality. So it's very much focused on the passion and the suffering of Christ. Um, so how do you guys see, how does this translate to catechesis? What are your thoughts on integrating the whole, but also the parts to our children? Mm -hmm. You go mm. for it, Carla. Well, it's not, I mean, it's certainly easier said than done. Uh, because as many times as you'll teach them something, they're only going to hear and retain a portion of it. So repetition Mm -hmm. um, is, is pretty important and not, I would say taking a respectful attitude toward all parts of the tradition and not trying to emphasize one or the other as if to give you, your, your pupils or your children some sort of implicit bias. Does that make sense? Like mm -hmm. if you say, well, this is all right, but you, you've, you've told them basically this is deficient in some way. You're saying this is acceptable, but so when, you know, when I, when I present the faith, um, I try to do it from as positive a position as I can, not here, especially with the, 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 the boys at school who may or may not be coming from a Catholic school before they get to us, whose families may or may not be very um, faithful or pious or what have you. It's more like, here's what we're all about instead of here's what we're against. So mm -hmm. instead of, Oh, we don't do that anymore. Um, it's like, yeah, we can do that. That's cool. Hey, check this out. This is cool too. Oh, mm -hmm. you like having a guitar at your mass. That's sweet. Have you ever been to a mass with an organ? You'd like it. It's really cool. Check it out. Um, so that, that kind of just, you know, I don't want to call it like, uh, I don't know. It seems, it seems sort of childish, but to just be upbeat, you know, I guess it is childish, but they're kids after all. So, you know, kind of, <laughs> kind of just not be, um, I don't, I don't want to be the, the, the mean father or the mean schoolmaster who's no, you must do it this way. I want it to be broad and emphasize, you know, there's, there's, there's many different ways to be a Catholic as long as you play within bounds. So we identify the boundaries and then we're off to the races. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this well, actually. Yeah. This whole this whole subject of catechizing actually would be a really good show, honestly, not gonna lie, just talking about like practical ways to catechize. So this fascinate this subject actually fascinates me. So I'm not gonna talk too long about it because we're running out of time. But I'll say this. So I've taught catechis catechism now to sixth graders for a couple of years. And what I have found is that the bounds in which talking about those bounds that you were talking about, that mm -hmm. because of the secular world the normative Christian, maybe societal bounds that we could have relied upon for analogy mm -hmm. or for reference are completely gone and shifted. And so I'd say this first and foremost, um, unless it's maybe your child, right, who's been under your wing and you've been catechizing for years, if you're going to catechize um, people in the context of a school, you have to approach, at least in my opinion, with the the understanding that they potentially know absolutely nothing about the Catholic faith. Right. Um, and therefore, you need to start from scratch. And I've learned this the hard way. And so what I've realized is that because I can't eat, I mean, there was a you know poll, maybe you guys have heard about it, but uh, not too long ago from millennials in the UK and Canada were sur surveyed, and 20% of them did not even know who the baby in the manger scene was. Right. Like we are in a not post-Christian, but anti-Christian. We're just so far past this. And so we can't even like if a kid comes into catechism class who's not Catholic. Right. Because his parents are sending him or something like that. Uh, we can't just assume that they know. And so the what I do is my big concern is twofold. How do I form their intellect and how do I inform their will? How do I basically ignite all the Imago Dei within them to point them to God? And how mm -hmm. I do that is I say, <clears throat> all right, first, this is going to be a serious class in the sense that, um, you know, it's not a time for goof off or things like that. Not that we can't have fun, 
but that we're going to be serious. And so what I do for my students is I give them the Baltimore catechism. I give them uh, note cards and we go line by line through it, right? We talk about, we explain, right? Each one of the questions and answers. But then the important thing is, is that I have them write out the question and the answer, memorize that, and then write out something small, basically explaining it that they can, in their own language, that they can remember, mm -hmm. right? And then I have them repeat these things back in tests, right? Both oral exam and written exam, because I want them to understand like the, the clear theology of the church. And so you start really basic, like, who is God, right? And then you just work all the way up there. Second thing is then with their will, I don't want to just form them to be abstract thinkers and that's it. I want them to be able to follow Christ with their whole heart. And so what I teach them from the beginning is, <clears throat> all right, how many of you guys know the Our Father? How many of you guys know the Hail Mary, the Apostles' Creed? Every single year, it's maybe like one student out of 20 like that actually knows all their prayers. Most have no clue. And so actually teaching them their prayers and saying, okay, you need to be doing your morning and your evening offering, right? Here are your prayers for that, your acts of faith, hope, and charity. And um, here's your rosary. Here's how you pray your rosary. Here's how you do 10 minutes of mental prayer. It's very, it, oddly enough, i um, saying this is Dominican, but it's a, it's a very Jesuit mindset of <laughs> uh, evangelization because it's kind of like if I was going over to like the Huron nations or the Japanese, mm -hmm. it's just kind of like, or, or even just like re-evangelizing, right, areas that are now Protestant. It's like, okay, here are the basics of the faith. Here's your catechism. Memorize this, right? Expl be, be able to explain it, right? Don't just have rogue memorization, but explain it. And here are the prayers that you need to be praying, at least on a daily level. And then you should shoot for a higher, right? And I think that that's just what's necessary because we have to realize that, you know, Western Europe, it's... It, the the battle for culture is lost in the sense of like going back to a better time. We have to reform it now and have something new. And so that's how we have to apply it when it comes to so much. Jesuit yes, approves, Cavazos. Yes, sir. Jesuit approves. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> oh, good. Never thought I'd John Brown that. in the house. <laughs> All right. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen. Uh, it's been uh, engrossing and intriguing for Paschal Tide. Stay tuned for our St. Joseph Dialogos this Wednesday night, as well as the Dialogos continues on Paschal Mystery next mm -hmm. month. Uh, reminder to join the guild, meaningofcatholic.com slash register to get all access and to support our apostolate. With that, let's offer up a Hail Mary and give it to Our Lady and invoke our patrons here at Meaning of Catholic. Fowler, you're my wingman. Name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Victory. Pray for us. Mary, Queen of the Home. Pray for us. St. Joseph, Terror of Demons. Pray for us. St. Anthony of the Desert, pray for all clergy and seminarians. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Amen.